Hello, thanks for joining us. I'm Tom Monahan, President and CEO of DeVry University. During today's digital dialogues, I'll be speaking with Alan Gannett, author of The Creative Curve, serial tech investor and entrepreneur. Alan was the founder and former CEO of TrackMaven, a marketing analytics platform whose clients included, among others, such great brand names as Microsoft, Marriott, Saks Fifth Avenue, Home Depot, Aetna, and GE. In 2018, it merged with Skyward to become the leading content marketing platform. Alan's book, The Creative Curve, also came out in 2018 from Penguin Random House. The book has been featured on CNBC, Forbes, numerous top podcasts, and has been translated into nine other languages. Alan also co-founded Accelerprise Ventures, which invests in early stage enterprise software companies through an accelerator model, and is currently an angel investor investing in pre-seed and seed companies based on the framework from the creative curve. I'm excited to get this conversation started because we've been taking a hard look at what uh, digital careers will look like and how advances in technology will reshape the skills that are necessary for people to thrive in technology-infused careers. And one thing that really leaps off the page is the importance of creativity in a world where uh, more and more things get automated, more and more things can be done uh, quickly on a technology platform. The role of creativity in, in driving an individual's career becomes ever more important. So uh, this will be a real uh, exciting conversation because not just about the importance of creativity, but a little bit about the fact that uh, one of the things, Ellen, we've been exploring in these conversations is, um, I think it was Will Rogers who said, um, you know, it, it, it ain't what we don't know that gets us in trouble. It's what it's what we know that just ain't so. And the thing that we know that just ain't so is the idea that there are creative people and non-creative people. And I think your book really and the work you've done says, no, this can be a learned skill. So I, I, I'm eager to get into this to do some do some myth busting here. But let me just start with I, I obviously know your story. We've had the chance to work together on stuff. But t t tell me, t tell tell the audience here your story. I'd love to hear particularly around your pivot into technology. You, you, you're a political science major a, as an undergrad and uh, yeah. from that platform launched a technology company. So at some point, <laughs> at some point this would, my guess is at some point this was supposed to be me interviewing senator, uh, but it became uh, me interviewing entrepreneur and investor. Oh, I'd be such a terrible senator. Um, so I, for me, the big thing was, you know, I went to college really dreaming of like working on political campaigns. I'd watched like every political documentary on the planet. I'd read every political memoir. And I sort of wanted to be like one of those campaign junkies. And the thing I sort of realized when I started interning and working things, I just didn't like the pace. Everything seemed so slow. There was so much, you know, obviously politics is political. And I was sort of like, well, if I do a good job, you know, it should work versus in politics, you can do a great job, you can work really hard, you can still lose. And so I got really interested at the same time in sort of technology and social media. This was back in like 2010, sort of when Facebook was considered a, a you know, a good actor. Um, the movie Social Network was coming out. And so I started building, you know, essentially with my friends, these Facebook apps back when Facebook had apps, like they were sort of like in the canvas, so to speak. And some of these apps went really viral. And I just got hooked on this idea that you could build something literally at that point from a dorm room and you could have it impact, you know, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people in a really, really short amount of time. And I'd always been sort of a human behavior geek. Like I've always been fascinated by why people do what they do. And here through the internet was a way to really sort of like study that and engage with it and um, you know learn a lot. And so I just fell in love with technology, I fell in love with marketing, I fell in love with social media. And I started doing marketing for a startup. And when I was doing that, I really fell in love with this question of like, why do audiences respond to certain things? And that led to starting my company, which was a marketing analytics company. Um, and then obviously, you know, eventually I sort of pivoted into writing and a big part of it is for me, what I found is that the questions I'm really fascinated by are these like big sort of nebulous things that we think of as very unstructured and sort of you can't wrap your head around like creativity. When in reality, there's like tons and tons of research and insights that we can drive on like why creativity happens and how to do it. And so really I've sort of made my life's work now to understand how we can better unlock human potential through basically demystifying these concepts. Um, mm. And yeah, so that, that's me 
and um, yeah. so so maybe let's dig into the creative curve and, and maybe more broadly when does a question or an issue go from hey that's interesting to yeah, hey, I, I, obviously, putting Creative Curve together was a was a multi year effort, and 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 you know the next big issue that sort of catches you and pulls you in is going to be a multi year effort. You know, maybe maybe go back to the the genesis of, you know, it, um, you're not a journalist, right? You're an investor and entrepreneur, and and that what was the question or what was the moment that that issue of creativity seized you and you said and you said okay. This is going to go well beyond a you know, a question that I'm going to yeah. think about. It's going to be one I'm going to dig into for a long period of time. Yeah, I I had you know my company that I ran for seven years. We our customers were marketers, mm -hmm. and I had always thought of marketers as very creative people. And I found that you know as you're running a company, you do a lot of dinners or one on ones with customers, and you get to know them. And I found they were very very insecure about their creativity. They were very worried about it. They were they would say things like, "I'm not that creative," or "I have to hire an agency for that," or "That's not me. I'm more of a numbers person." And I was sort of like taken aback by this because I was thinking, "Well, obviously you're creative. Like you're running marketing. You're the creative person at the company." And so I gave a talk um, at a marketing conference about the myths around creativity. And I just you just could see like people's eyes lighting up, and you could see there was like a lot of interest in learning about it, and you know, for me, that sort of triggered this impulse of like, part of it is, I'm, you know, I grew up in New Jersey, I get sort of frustrated. And part of me is I get frustrated when people don't live up to their potential. I think it's kind of like one of these things, I'm like, you're only gonna live once. Like you need to live up to your potential, like let's go. Uh, but I realized that's not a very constructive way to deal with it. And so for me, it sort of translates into wanting to like teach and wanting to like, you know, explore and talk. Um, and so, yeah, I remember like after that talk just being like, hey, like, you know, I know most CEOs of marketing tech companies write books eventually, so maybe this is my book. Um, I talked to some friends who had written books, and um, you know, I had to be doing it part time, so it took a long time to write. It took like three and a half years, um, but it was one of those things where, like, the more I explored, the more I got fascinated by this question. And you know, after that book came out, basically, I you know, you know, talked about it for a few years, did a lot of talks, and I got really fascinated by the concept I'm working on now. So I have a book that's coming out next year. Um, that I just announced for recently, but um, the book's on insecurity and self-doubt because I found that, hey, I wrote this book on creativity, sort of explaining, we can go into some of the like actionable things, but explaining like how you can actually be more creative and like explain the science about it and all this stuff. And then what I found is that like people will still be like, well, I'm just, I'm too insecure to do that. Like, that's not me, like I'm scared. And this is that time in my life where I'd gotten divorced. I had like sort of done a lot of identity and soul searching. I realized that like I'm very insecure. And so it's like, wow, this like word insecure is just so prevalent in our society. And it's something that we can be sort of scared to talk about. And I sort of got that same feeling of like, well, I wonder if I can like demystify this for people and explain it. You know, could that help people sort of like move past it, at least in some small way? And so for me, that's really the con the things I like to dive into are these things that feel like these very ambiguous sort of obstacles. Um, and my sort of like type A energy is like, well, let's explain it. And you know, if we can explain sure. it, we can start to calm it. Can maybe dig into that a little bit, which is the book does and, and your speaking and work is has myth busted a lot around the you know, we're, we're all told that there are these, you know, great creative geniuses who arrive on the scene, uh, you know, fully formed, and, and they just have it, whatever it is. And the rest of us are told you probably don't have it, whatever it is. And, and that was decidedly not your, your learning as you really yeah. dug into the science here. What kind of, who can be creative and, yeah. and, and what, what are the, maybe, probably most importantly, what are the disciplines that any one of us can can put to work. Yeah, great question. So the first thing to understand is like, where do our ideas of creativity come from? And they really come from essentially movies and entertainment and sort of that sort of world. And it's been a it's been going on for thousands of years. So the term genius is actually a Latin root. I think it's genus or however you pronounce it. I never took Latin high school, but it basically means like a spirit that possesses you. And so we've had this idea of like creativity as like semi-divine thing for a very, very long time. And fundamentally, like if you think about the movie Amadeus, like Mozart is three years old 
like this is the opening scene. He's three years old. He's blindfolded. He's playing the piano for the Pope. Like we have these like deep rooted imagery and culture of like these creative geniuses. And like the reality is like that's not the actual story of Mozart. Like Mozart mm-hmm. basically had a helicopter dad who made him practice three hours a day, seven days a week, starting at the age of three. Like the first true concerto he wrote when he was like 16 or 17, which is after you know 13 or 14 years of practicing three hours, seven days a week. Like this is not the story of sort of just popping out one day and saying, I can play the piano uh, for kings and queens. But um, you know, fundamentally, what when you look at creativity, what you find is that the most successful creatives um, really do four things really well. I can dive into them a bit too, but the four things really well is one is that they are really active consumers of their niche. So often we think about creatives and consumers in opposition to each other, right? Creators create, consumers consume. Mm-hmm. But in reality, like the best jazz musicians listen to every single jazz record. The best tech entrepreneurs are huge users of technology and they're geeks and they're diving into this stuff. Um, and so this isn't like going on Twitter, right? And learning a little bit about a lot of things, but mm-hmm. rather what you find is that creative success comes from specialized knowledge. Um, and I can talk more about why that is. The second mm-hmm. element is that creatives are part of a community. So we tend to have this image of the lone wolf, right? We talk about Steve Jobs, for example. But Steve Jobs to me is a great example because Steve Jobs was not actually a lone wolf. On day one, he had Steve Wozniak. He actually had multiple employees very early on because he raised a lot of venture capital pretty quickly, actually. Um, you know, Later in his career, he had Johnny Ive and Tim Cook, who he relied on. What you actually find is that great creatives are really good about being aware of their weaknesses and finding other people who can come in and support them on their weaknesses. Now, how credit is given is actually very mm-hmm. different, right? So think about mm-hmm. a, a pop album, the song, you know, the singer on the front is given a lot of credit, even though there's a whole team of songwriters and producers and engineers and all these things. Um, so, there, so there's that. And then the other one that's really important is iteration. So, you know, this idea that creatives are sort of stuck by lightning and they're just, you know, they're going out there and, you know, they write a book in a week, it's done. That occasionally happens, but most great creatives we know are highly iterative. They work on it, they edit it, they get feedback, they get data. They're constantly, constantly working at it. And the last one I think is most surprising for people is that great creatives imitate. So when you think about the things that have best worked, what you actually find is that they tend to be a little combination of the old and some of the new. They're not just things that are like radically new or radically novel. You know, the explanation I like to give, the example I like to give is the iPad. The iPad was actually Apple's second attempt at a tablet computer. The first was in the early 90s, was the Apple Newton, it failed. Mm -hmm. It was too sort of weird. Fast forward 20 years, and the iPad was actually sort of an incremental, you know, sort of imitating a bigger iPhone, right, without a phone. And the iPhone was an iPod with a phone, and the iPod was a better MP3 player. And so you find that creativity tends to come by sort of taking something that already exists and adding a little bit of something new, and that's really where the magic tends to happen. I'd love to dive into the first one. I love dive into all of them, but I'm going to start with the first one, which is you, you can sort of imagine that in the digital media age, yeah, it's a double-edged sword. To your point, um, I, I, yeah, I, I, I don't consider professional baseball my niche at all, but I read a lot about Big Pappy getting yeah. elected to the Hall of Fame today, which is not going to take me anywhere particularly interesting, right? But oh, yeah. what are the, you know, it, 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 in the world we live in, what are the, you know, what, how do you develop that muscle? And you know, what, what have you seen people do to sort of get, you know, kind of per, pursue yeah. that level of mastery, I guess? So there's two things. One is that, you know, you want to spend a pretty sizable chunk amount of time. So what you find is that I call it the 20% principle, but I found that when I interviewed, so I interviewed 25 living creative greats. These are everyone from like Oscar winners, to Tony Award winners. It's folks like Ted Sarandos, who's the co-CEO of Netflix, to Pasek and Paul, who wrote La La Land and Dear Evan Hansen. What I found is that they all spend about three to four hours of your of their day, which is about 20% of their time, consuming content. So they're constantly ingesting. So that's sort of data point one. So you've just spent a lot of time. The second thing is that how they consume information is different than how maybe you or I consume information. So when they're consuming information, they're constantly assessing how is this similar or different 
to sort of like the framework I have in my head for a song or a movie or for a startup or whatever it is. So when they're looking at these things, they're constantly looking at sort of almost think about it as like metaphors or Mad Libs. So, you know, I talk to a lot of pop songwriters and there's a certain structure to how pop songs are written. So when they listen to a new song, they're comparing it to that framework in their head and seeing what did that person do that was different. They're not going into this sort of like subconscious state where they're just sort of like absorbing it and enjoying it, but rather they're sort of actively participating and engaging with it as they consume it. So I think that's a really important and interesting nuance, right? It's not just enough if you mm. want to be a filmmaker to watch a lot of movies, but yep. you have to watch those movies with a lot of intention and structure and understand what is this filmmaker doing and what can I learn from it? You know, in, I want to, um, first I want to flag the audience that we will have time. I, I, I promise not, not to monopolize all the questions. So if folks have uh, questions, just put them in the chat and we'll, uh, we'll, we'll get them into the conversation. But I want to dive into the second one, which is community where, um, uh, ironically, I, you don't know if you remember, but I think we, you were one of the last people I saw live before the lockdown. Yeah. Right? You, and I, you and I had yeah. lunch on sort of March 5th or something of, of 2020. And, uh, you know, community, it, it, the, the meaning of it has changed. I guess there's almost two questions here. What, you know, what did the research show about how community plays a role in creativity? And how have you observed that changing as we've gone through this period where community has had to manifest in different ways. Yeah, such a great question. So there's a few different um, roles that people sort of assemble in their creative community. So a few of them are obvious, a few of them are non-obvious. Um, one is a master teacher. So this is someone that is sort of world-class who's willing to teach you. You find that in studies that look at people who've achieved world-class feats, they all, all of them, at some point had a world-class teacher. So that's really, really important, right? You wanna play tennis with people who are better than you. Mm -hmm. The second one that I think is really interesting is this idea of what I call prominent promoter. But you tend to find that people bring in people who are further in their careers in their creative communities. And those people who are further in their careers, they sort of lend credibility to that person so they can actually get mm. the sort of time and space to be recognized. So in startups, this is like a board of advisors or a board of directors. In music, it's like opening acts and academic. Academia, it's like the senior professor like co-authoring a paper even though they didn't do any work, but it allows it to get into a journal. But this idea of sort of lending your credibility is like a very sort of time-honored tradition in creative fields. And it actually is good for both parties because the person who's further in their career benefits from the new ideas and the novelty and the fresh perspectives of this sort of younger, typically younger person. Um, the other one I like to talk about is I call it like a modern muse. But basically you find that creatives tend to surround themselves also with people who sort of inspire and motivate them. Often this is other people in their field. So like mm -hmm. it's really hard to be the only painter, right, in your friend group. But you see folks like the beatnik poets, right? They're like assembling a group of people around them and that inspires friendly competition and they learn and there's tactics and there's all this sort of things that you can sort of pick up. Now, what's interesting is that I traditionally thought of this as like being really important that it happens offline. So mm -hmm. there's this concept in sociology of clustering, which is the idea that creative professions tend to cluster in geographic areas because so much of creativity is, is community. Mm -hmm. So like meeting someone at a cocktail party or like a happy hour or bar is like actually pretty important. That's serendipity. But obviously with COVID, that's changed a lot. So like, how has that changed? Well, what I'm finding, which is really interesting, is that the offline is still really important, but it's no longer necessary. So what I'm finding is that if your creative community is one that acts and engages primarily online or in significant part online, then it's all rapidly changing, right? So if you, for example, are working in like crypto or NFTs or tech startups, that is a very sort of online first and digitally first world, then you can sort of do this entire thing online. Like I know people who moved to Ann Arbor, Michigan, out of San Francisco and are doing just as much sort of creative work as they were when they were living in San Francisco mm -hmm. sort of tech field. Now, if you were doing painting, for example, like fine art painting, you still have to be in New York, LA, Paris, London. Like you just, you do, because people have to come and see your work and physically. So I think we're just starting to see is this divergence where mm. it used to be that mm. digital first industries still had a lot of offline connection. 
now you're seeing a digital first industries it's sort of becoming optional that's really interesting maybe one of the things that struck me in in I should say rereading the book because of course I read it in 2018 is I, I had mentally had a perspective that creativity was the opposite of productivity, that it was kind of <laughs> yeah. like, you know, um, you know, all that, you know, getting stuff done was one part of the brain and creativity was, you know, you can only begin by canceling all your meetings for the next hundred weeks and walking barefoot you know, staring at the sky. And, and there's there's some reconciliation uh, and some disciplines that actually both kind of objectives seem to share. And, and I'd love to just kind of, you know, the it's not quite the seven habits of highly creative people, but the idea that you know, there, there are, you know, some of that same methodology of there are routines you want to be in to be creative struck me as, a, you know, that I was thinking about totally. it totally the wrong way. So I think the thing for me is I'm very inputs focused. So mm -hmm. I think, you know, a lot of people obsess when they talk about productivity on outputs, right? Like, okay, I want to write, you know, five hours a day or do this. I'm very inputs oriented in my routine. So where am I like ingesting new data and materials? Like where am I consuming? And I, I go really deep in the book on the sort of power of the right hemisphere of our brain. So mm -hmm. it's really cliche to talk about left brain, right brain. It's actually like very scientifically important and valid, but basically, your right hemisphere is really good at connecting disparate ideas together. But if you don't sort of give it the raw materials, like it's not going to do it. Like if you don't listen to a lot of music, your right brain isn't going to work on coming up with interesting melodies or tunes or all that kind of stuff. And so what I find is that most people sort of over routinize, I guess that's a word, their outputs and under do it on their inputs. And actually it's much more of a balance. The other thing I like to think about when it comes to sort of daily routines is that we have a ton of research that shows that everyone's sort of body is different and everyone engages with time in different ways. So some people are great at writing at night. Some people are great at writing in the morning. Um, some people like I basically, my life is like, I write for you know three hours in the morning and then I do other stuff. I do my startup and it's investing and I do like all of that world sort of afternoons and evenings because I find I can't really write more than three hours a day. And I just like have organized my life sort of around that concept. And if I tried and I have tried in the past to just write all day, I just get emotionally drained and frustrated. Mm -hmm. uh, and I know some people who it's the opposite, right? Like they like to work in the long hours of the evening. So I think the two big concepts that I think about when it comes to actually getting stuff done, one is create more routines around your inputs. And then when it comes to outputs, be more accepting of your sort of natural rhythms to the degree that you can, rather than sort of read advice about what so-and-so famous author did. So basically what you're saying, if as the pandemic becomes endemic, we should insist every single human being report to the office at nine uh, <laughs> and work in a structured format till five. Is that kind of the that basic? That is exactly, yeah. With you know, Excellent. one hour break, 15 minutes, that is definitely what's going to lead to productivity. Excellent. Yeah, excellent. I'm glad to hear that. Well, maybe talk about just, and I know I, I don't, I don't want to, I, I don't want to force you to, to to disclose the the next book um, before it's done. Obviously, <laughs> you've got work to do. But there's, you know, maybe talk a little bit about, um, you know, we're we're a university at our core. We're in the business of helping people unlock their potential. Um, the the great thing about where we are right now is what whatever you want to call it the great resignation the great reassessment whatever is uh, employers by definition have to unlock potential in their organizations for a bunch of reasons they never had to before they can no longer rely on going to the spot market and just grabbing talent they need because uh, we're in a chronic supply demand imbalance. Um, they have to be known as a great place for someone to you know, achieve things, and otherwise they're going to lose in the war for talent. But what, you know, in terms of uh, unlocking potential, in terms of helping people realize what they're capable of, you know, if, if, you know, if, yeah. if, you had, if you had the CEOs of your portfolio companies sitting around a table, what advice would you give them? Yeah, I mean, I think like 
one of the biggest things I'm thinking a lot about, so the new book is on insecurity, and I sort of break down insecurity in different types. And one of the forms of insecurity that I'm most fascinated by is this sensation that people have, the feeling that they're not talented enough. And talented enough, you could put like smart enough, like any sort of form of like natural talent. Mm-hmm. Um, and to me, that's that that is like very widespread in society. It's very widespread among employees. Uh, it's very widespread among leaders too. And there's this sort of conundrum I find, which is really fascinating, which is that there tends to be with that form of insecurity, this attribution error where people think they're not smart enough. So they work extra hard and they're successful because they worked extra hard. And then they look back and they say, well, yeah, because I'm not smart. So I had to work those you know, incremental three hours to in order to achieve. And the thing is that and it becomes this like negative reinforcing loop where like as they become more successful, they, they feel like they have to work harder and harder to maintain it. And then they're more and more credit that success with that sort of Herculean effort. And the thing is, I think a lot of this comes from our sort of like media predispositions where we you know hear these stories about, you know, the Steve Jobs or you know, these sort of Pablo Picasso people. And we think it was easy for them. And it wasn't like these people are incredibly hardworking, right? Like, um, you know, it's like, a lot of these people, you know, when you ask them how often they sleep at three or four hours a day, like the ability to exert significant amounts of effort, like is talent, yeah. that is inherently yeah. a skill. And so for me, that's the thing I tell managers, like the biggest thing you, sh- you can coach people on um, is this idea that they're not talented enough and like digging into that attribution error, um, I think can bring a lot of people, I think I've seen a lot of sense of wholeness and productivity because they realize that, wow, I'm actually able to do this thing. And that is me doing it, right? The effort is still sort of coming back um, and being from me. Let me let me f- switch gears to your investing activities, uh, uh, which are, you know, our, our students are in technology, right? They are there uh, where De- DeVry is uh, known as one of the places where yeah, you know, we we prepare people for success in the technology economy, and um, that's particularly hard for a university, at least historically, because you're if you're starting today, you're getting your degree in four or five years, and the the whole world looks different. The good, you know, we've changed how we think about that as a university, but it still requires a little bit of future casting. Um, you know, what what's what's catching your eye? You know, pre pandemic, yeah. during pandemic, post pandemic. You know, if you were counseling a uh, a student who's kind of saying, okay, a year from now I'm going to be, you know, taking my next big step, you know, where, where would you say to step in this direction? This technology is going to be important or this dynamic is going to be important? Yeah, so I have a few sort of big concepts or thoughts that I think are really, um, I think are interesting. And I think, you know, so one is, um, I think, you know, sort of a lot of people coming out of, you know, maybe a master's program think about consulting. And I think that you're starting to see generalized consulting, um, I think, starting to fall apart to some degree. I mean, you look at the articles I've written about McKinsey, and, you know, or I've written about BCG or any of these. And it's like there's some there's a change of happening. And so I think specialized consulting is where that sort of world is going, like much, much more specific. Um, I think that in finance. I'm I went from like the biggest crypto skeptic um, up until 2020 to like fully you know down the rabbit hole and sort of realizing this idea that um you know if people can have um direct access to ownership um they would rather have that and that's a really powerful force Mm -hmm. um and so the idea of the world becoming tokenized i think i thought was sort of a meme um, but actually is really powerful and i think in particular it's going to disrupt traditional finance institutions. So I would be really mindful about working at any traditional finance institutions that aren't pursuing crypto really aggressively. And a lot of the big banks now are. Um, so I think that's, but again, I would be mindful of that. Um, and then in terms of like in the healthcare industry, you know, there is, I think there's a lot of things I don't know about that I think um, probably are really interesting. The ones that I'm really fascinated are is like, I think this RNA work is really fascinating, but also, um, I'm really fascinated with sort of gut health, microbiome. Um, you know, I think in terms of like what is the dominant health trend of the 2020s, like what is the thing we're talking the most about? Um, I think five years from now, we're all going to be talking about gut health in the same way we talk today about our cholesterol or about mm-hmm. um, blood pressure. And so I think there's a lot of really interesting innovation there. One question that just came in that that um, it relates both to, to your 
personal journey, but also the creativity story, which is uh, uh, David R. asked, you know, hey, you you drew on analogies from music, you know, um, it, it, I'll, it he specifically says, hey, do you have a musical background? But more broadly, like, how does yeah, in a, in a work life world where we're starting to imagine that stuff we do outside of work, um, you know, the boundaries are porous and there's no. But you know, what what activities kind of interests have influenced your career and 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 how does that factor into creativity and innovation more broadly? Yeah, so um, I played guitar for six years. I don't think it counts a musical background, but um, I did I did have that phase. I fully was in a pop punk band. Um, and, um, you know, I grew up, my family, um, on my dad's side is very musical as like professional musicians. Um, but, you know, I think, you know, for me, the big influences sort of are for me is really reading. Like I, I'm a voracious reader, I guess that's a cliche term. Um, but I think I once read like, a, like a how to God and how to speed read when I was like 19. And that since has been this like huge unlock. I like very much suggest like learning how to speed read. It's there's act, it's like a skill, like you can develop it. Um, it's actually kind of fun because then it feels like, I don't know, you just feel like you you can read all this stuff and so much quicker. Um, and so that for me is a big influence. Like I read really widely. Um, I have like pretty eclectic tastes in readings. So like, I love James Patterson, even though it's James Patterson. Mm -hmm. Uh, but I also love like fine art literature and I also love self-help books and nonfiction. And so for me, that has been like a really like it's given me a lot of life. And then I'm a, a big um, animal person. So I like I'm very much a dog guy. Um, and I found that like that has actually been very ritualistic for me, like going on long walks with my dog and the quiet. They're just like it gave me an excuse to go on long walks that I wouldn't have gone on before. And that's actually led to a lot of really good creative thinking time has become now sort of like part of my process, which feels kind of silly, but is like, but I, I don't know, I feel like culturally it's sort of weird to go on a walk by yourself in the silence, but with a dog, all of a sudden it's like very okay, so. That's funny. Yeah, well, I, I since we're bumping up against time, I'm gonna, I'm gonna pivot from that into a question I've been asking guests here, which is, um, yeah, the famously Charles William Eliot put together the Harvard classics where he said, you know, everything that any educated person needs to know can fit on this bookshelf. And we you know, obviously the, the time for that has come and gone. But we're trying to assemble sort of a it's you know, wh whether it's a, uh, you know, box, you know, five foot box shoulder <laughs> folder or something. I don't know what it is, but kind of what what would you point people to to? to read to yeah yeah and, read, I, and I actually or listen, have, or listen to or what's what's on your yeah what's on your virtual nightstand yeah and i actually have on my linkedin there's a i, I do every year an article of i haven't done the 2022 edition yet of like my must read so i think it has like 67 books on it so it's definitely worth checking out um they might be able to drop the link in the comments but um you know the books for me that are sort of like go-to's are on this sort of like self-help sort of side is i think the four agreements is like really really powerful book um it's a book sort of about like accepting yourself and to some degree forgiving yourself which i think is just like a really powerful message um on entrepreneurship i think the hard thing about hard things by ben harowitz um mm -hmm. who is the co-founder of jason harowitz is probably one of the best business books and that it's the most real around like what's it like to hire your best friend and have to let them go like just this this the real side of entrepreneurship i think it does a really good job of uh, describing and going into. Um, I love um, basically every book that Dan Pink has written. He's, a, I think, a wonderful writer, very talented. He writes about sort of like human behavior and business, um, someone I look up to a lot. Um, and what else? And then I read, um, I read, I know it's cliche, but I read, you know, Dale Carnegie, How to Win Friends and Influence People every few years. And I find that um it's just like good evergreen advice i wish the title didn't feel so like i don't know it feels so manipulative but like um but the actual book is basically about how to like just be kind and like yeah. why being kind is important and i think it's a really good reminder in this digital age where sometimes it can feel like efficiency is like the most important thing i think it's a great book to read to rem just remember it's like also important to be like kind so those would be my like my big ones great fantastic we are we are at time, so I'm going to start by saying thank you, and uh, we we will we will make sure we create linkages out to that uh, fully curated list. But that's a great <laughs> addition to our 
to our dialogue here. Thanks for sharing your thoughts on this topic. I'm sure our audience found this every bit as valuable as I did. And thanks to the audience, uh, both uh, live today and those who will catch it down the road. Uh, be sure to follow us on LinkedIn and so you can hear about more, more exciting follow-up from this conversation and more exciting dialogues like this down the road. Thanks everyone, have a great day. Bye.